Everybody loves and dive in with a little bit of brute action right now. So I grew up in Southern Ontario, and in Southern Ontario, the classic thing is to go up to the cottage. You leave the big city, you leave Toronto behind, and you go to a place where you can be out on a nice lake with a fire pit uh, roaring, and the most amazing thing that can happen to you when you're in cottage country is to hear the call of a loon. If you are tuning into this program and you've never heard the call of a loon, just leave when you're done and make sure you get a chance to hear that. We might get a chance to hear it in today's presentation, but they are just spectacular creatures. And so today we are joined by Jennifer Denny at the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation to tell us a little bit about uh, some of the amazing work that they do to protect this special, special creature and highlight them in the world. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being part of our BioFest today. Hey, thank you so much for the warm welcome. I feel privileged to be amongst such, such a group of passionate speakers. <laughs> I think every speaker that comes in is just sort of like, wow, like look at these people that are before and after me and you're all uh, so belong here. It, it's such a, a special chance to highlight so many different species and habitats around the world. So I'm excited to hear more about the work that you do about these loons and to dive in with a great Q&A at the end. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm going to share my presentation with all of you. Perfect. While you're doing that too, for everyone at home's sake, I'll put up adkloon.org if you want to learn more about Jennifer's work and the amazing work of their organization. I'll put that in the chat for all our YouTube viewers too. Oh, there we go. Presentation's up, or almost up, and you'll be good to go. <laughs> Very meta, beautiful. Right. That's great. Can you all see the loon? The moment, yep, yeah, you go full slide. Oh, doing weird things. No, so uh, go to the very top where it says display settings. Yes. Yeah, click that guy, and then it uh, swap presenter view and slideshow. Try that. Perfect. And then at the very bottom, there's a little stream yard sharing your screen. Just drag that guy to the side, and then you'll be all, oh, no, don't press no. high. <laughs> Sometimes people's computers like to do weird things to that. You're good. Um, okay. Take your time. All good. Very right back to the presentation. And, yep, perfect. You are good to go. All right. Here we go. So today I'll be talking about conservation through the lives of Adirondack loons. And I really hope that many of our visitors today have had the experience that Jesse has, the opportunity to hear loons on a lakeshore uh, somewhere in the northern parts of uh, North America or Canada. Um, and I hope that this slideshow will help to bring those memories back. I come from an organization called the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. And our mission is to inspire passion for and promote the conservation of Adirondack loons as an environmental sentinel. And we do that using the tools of research and education. We've been doing this work since 1998. We originally began as the Adirondack Cooperative Loon Program underneath the Biodiversity Research Institute, but we became our own independent nonprofit in 2017. So why study loons and not one of these other really wonderful species that are covered in in this global biodiversity festival well <laughs> there's a lot of great reasons they're the top predator in adirondack aquatic ecosystems they're territorial so generally the same loons re return to the same lakes year after year and they occupy the same territories on that lakes on those lakes and they're very aggressively territorial, so they defend those territories. This loon is doing something called a penguin dance, which is a territorial display that they'll use to try to scare away humans, intruding loons, and predators. If you're ever the uh, focus of a penguin dance, it's a good thing to back up. <laughs> loons are extremely long-lived. They uh, in many cases, live to be 25 to 35 years old. Uh, I found this story out of Michigan last year about these two loons that had 16 chicks together over the course of 25 years. And uh, I find that it's really interesting because um, all across their range, they're extremely long-lived. Uh, we believe that they live just as long in the Adirondacks, but our banding studies haven't been going on that long. Loons are a very charismatic symbol of the wilderness. So I get a lot more support saying help protect loons than I would saying help protect moss or help protect fungi. <laughs> and they're a biological indicator. So they help us to know how the rest of the ecosystem around them is faring and surviving. And lastly, they're a species of special concern in New York. 
which means that we're not the only ones who are focused on protecting them. There are five species of loons. Our common loon is up here on the left, the, er, in the left of the other photos, which is the one that we'll be talking mostly about today. To its right is the yellow bill loon, which is uh, the largest of our species of loons. Below it is the more exotic Arctic loon. Below that is the red-throated loon, which sometimes we're fortunate enough to see during its migration through the area. And then above that is the Pacific loon, which of course hangs out the far western part of the United States. Uh, over here, we're looking at a range map. So uh, in case you're not familiar with where the Adirondacks in northern New York is, you can see it here at the very edge of the pink, which uh, at the top of New York State um, is the southern extent of the breeding range of the common loon. They're often regarded as the feathered fish. They're fantastic swimmers. Their bodies are really well adapted to cutting through the water swiftly, enabling them to catch very fast moving fish, which are one of their major, major prey items here in the Adirondacks. I'll play that again so you can see. They have these huge feet that are about the size of a human hand and laterally flattened legs that help to cut down resistance as they're forcing their way through the water. They also can dive to depths of 200 feet and are extremely dense, so they're really well adapted to diving. Uh, when loon chicks first hatch, they're extremely cute. <laughs> they are these little downy puff balls, and then the three-week mark is when they start to uh, become unable to ride on their parents' backs anymore, which you saw in one of the previous slides. Uh, it's uh, one of the, the most endearing things about loons, I think. <laughs> and so um, after these three weeks, they've uh, gone through their first molt, but they don't have juvenile plumage yet, which is what this, this loon does down here with a kind of sleek brown look to it. Um, it's ducked down in the water a little bit. This juvenile plumage will allow the young loons to fly at about 12 weeks of age, but they can't quite yet at nine weeks. And they won't enter this adult breeding plumage until after their first year of life. So if you see a loon that has this beautiful black and white coloration, it's an adult loon. And one of the things that we love most about loons definitely has to be the noises that they make. <laughs> so I'm going to start by playing one of the ones that I think is most well loved. You'll probably recognize it. It's called the whale. <laughs> The whale is a contact call that loons will use to say, hey, I'm a loon. Are there any other loons on this lake? They can use that call to find each other over long distances. Next, I'm going to play the tremolo, which is another pretty common call. <laughs> That tremolo can be a sound of disturbance. So the loon's feeling a little uncomfortable. Maybe there's a predator nearby or a human that's getting too close. And they'll, they'll make that noise as they're trying to get away. Uh, they'll also use the tremolo as a flight call. So as they're in the air, you'll hear them tremoloing overhead. Next, I'm gonna play the yodel, which is a call that's only made by male loons. They'll use it to defend their territories. squeaky. It's not likely that you'll forget that noise anytime soon. This loon here in the blue picture to the right is making that yodel noise. And uh, once again, that's only made by the males. I'm going to jump back up to the hoot. This hoot noise 
isn't very commonly heard by humans because it's just a conversation. It's a loon that's just talking to another loon casually. They're not reacting to anything. They're just going about their lives. So it's pretty quiet. You're lucky if you hear this noise. And then last, I want to play the chick begging call for you. Because for the first 12 weeks of the chick's life, the young loons beg incessantly. They are bugging their parents for food around the clock. Yeah, that soft little noise would be made by a very young loon. So we evolved to help protect these loons from the many threats that affect their habitats. It's not easy to be a loon. As you can see on this list, there are a lot of different human introduced threats. The only one here that comes naturally is wildlife predators. The Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation initially started out focusing on loon mercury research. That's how we got our humble beginnings. And the reason for this was that there was coal burning power plants west of here that were expelling mercury into the atmosphere. And it was settling down into our lakes as atmospheric deposition. Elemental mercury by itself isn't harmful to wildlife. But when it transforms into methylmercury, which it happens especially in acidic conditions like in Adirondack lakes, it then can be bio, it can bioaccumulate in the tissues of organisms and it works its way up the food chain. And I mentioned earlier on that loons are the top predator in Adirondack aquatic ecosystems. So they're most heavily impacted by the methylmercury, which is a neurotoxin. So it causes them to become lethargic and depressed. Males suffer more than females because they're larger and can eat larger, more carnivorous fish. So they tend to get more mercury accumulated over the course of their lives. And females can deposit it into their eggs, which they're not trying to do, but it does reduce the amount of mercury in their bodies. And uh, having this uh, you know, neurotoxin in their bodies causes them to uh, not do as well, a good of a job raising their chicks. Uh, or if it's a high mercury chick, the, the chick can struggle to be able to get on and off the parents' backs. Um, so it's not good for them to have a lot of mercury in their ecosystem. So back in 1998, we started studying mercury around all of the watersheds of the Adirondack Park. So here you can see, here's uh, New York State in the bottom part of this, uh, this slide. And then we're up here in the northern part that you probably don't often think about. <laughs> and um, Saranac Lake is up here in the northern part of this little uh, this Adirondack Park postage stamp. And um, by the way, this is a six million acre region, <laughs> so it's pretty big. And we have 100 study lakes spread out all around this Adirondack Park. And by doing this uh, research over the course of you know almost 20 years now, we've managed to develop a mercury hazard profile where we know the spatial and temporal distribution of mercury in the loons themselves. And yes, this, this loon is eating a fairly large Northern Pike. So we get this information during our annual loon capture and banding sessions. So in order to find out how much mercury is in the loons, we have to take a blood sample. For that, we have to catch them. So we do that by using a bright light. It's like loon jacking. We'll shine it in the loon's eyes late at night in the dark and the loon is, can't see, doesn't see the person in the boat. Simultaneously, we'll play those calls that I was just playing for all of you. A chick begging call to draw in adults and an adult who to try to draw in a chick. And so this loon is hearing loon noises, swimming closer and closer to the boat, which it can't see. And then eventually, uh, when they get close enough, we'll scoop them up in a substantial salmon net. And uh, then they get four bands, two per leg, and it's different color combinations. We also use things like stripes and circles and dots to help tell individuals apart from a distance. And they also get a silver band for individual identification close up. And well, we have the loon in hand is when we collect that blood sample that helps us know more about the mercury in the loon's blood. 
simultaneously, we are monitoring reproductive success. So those 100 study lakes that I mentioned earlier, we try to have uh, feel our field staff visit every one of them for 12 weeks during the course of the summer. And we record information about whether or not loons return to their territories, if they set up a nest, if they uh, have bands like this loon here, uh, and if they successfully reproduce, and then if that chick fledges. A really helpful tool for us is nest cameras. We can't see everything that goes on at the loon nest. So sometimes very big events happen to them while we're not there. So uh, for instance, these uh, nest cameras captured here, this little loon chick is down here in the water while its parent is rolling over another egg. So it tells us a little bit about asynchronous hatching, so not hatching at the same time. Here in the middle of the screen, you can see three loon eggs in a nest, which is really unique because most Adirondack loons only lay one or two eggs. Although if you get up into Canada, you might be seeing three or four. And we also found out who loons hang out with when we're not around, such as beavers and great blue herons. And these nest cameras also taught us a little bit about predation. Like if our field staff member had been paddling around the lake one day and then came the next day and discovered that the eggs were gone, they wouldn't have necessarily known who took them. But with the nest camera, we're able to find out about how often black bears steal our, our loon eggs. And unfortunately, we get a lot of this. <laughs> People who are just way too close to the, uh, the loons that are nesting. So uh, we use these pictures to inform our educational goals. Another major research project that we do is our annual loon census. So we have volunteers go out to lakes all over New York State and count the number of loons. Helps to give us an idea of how many loons there are overall in the region. And we, then we can find out population dynamics. Is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? So this is a great tool and uh, it also in, involves a lot of volunteers. So uh, this, is a very, this is a fully volunteer-based effort and it's something that you can participate in. If, you're in New York, or if you are in um, Maine, New Hampshire, or Vermont, you can participate in this uh, with your local loon conservation organization. It's a pretty widespread activity. So we take all of this information that we've gathered and we use it to inform policymakers, all the way from the New York state up to the global level, because things like merc mercury, uh, and atmospheric deposition aren't specific to our state, they're coming from elsewhere. So the further that we can get our studies, the better. And we also learn to inform the public, so, or we spread our, our, what we've learned to the public. Uh, we lead paddles, give presentations, we try to get the word out there in any way we can. So thank you for joining me tonight. Um, of course, it's important for me to reach audiences that are not in the summering habitat because loons migrate. So even though they might not breed in your area, they may simply pass through or spend, spend the winter in your area. Adirondack loons generally spend uh, the winters off the coast of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, Vermo Vermont, uh, you know, uh, Long Island. They're generally staying around the Northeast, but some of them get much further south, such as this one in Florida and one over in Virginia. We do a number of management and stewardship programs that we run. Um, we will protect individual loons because like I mentioned, they're long lived. So by saving one loon from certain death, you might then help to improve the population for many years because of the offspring that that loon might have. So we'll help out in situations where a loon is tangled in fishing line, which happens all too often or when they get stuck into a little hole in the ice um, by migrating too late in the winter time. So uh, we'll help out with loon rescues all year round. Of course, we prefer it when, they, when we don't have to rescue them at all. So we've implemented a fishing line recycling program where volunteers monitor these tubes at their favorite fishing sites. And we hope that people will uh, safely recycle their fishing line. Red tackle ingestion is also a major problem for Adirondack loons. Um, eating just one piece of lead tackle is enough to kill them. So 
uh, we're asking people to try to fish only using non-toxic tackle, such as uh, steel and ceramic um, or titanium. There's a lot of options out there. There's just even sand. Um, so uh, we've partnered with local retailers to uh, for people to bring in one ounce or more of lead tackle and trade it in to get a $10 voucher to then purchase non-lead tackle from that retailer. Um, it's funded by a grant. So it's really a win-win-win. It's a great time to clean out your tackle box. And we're also partnering with uh, groups of neighbors all around the Adirondack Park who simply want to do some activities around their lake to reduce the amount of human disturbance and make sure that their lakes are safe for nesting balloons and other wildlife for years to come. So the Loon Friendly Lake Certification Program uh, puts us in a leadership role to guide them through that process. And we're also trying to get the word out there through boat launch signs, presentations, field trips, newsletters, and of course, social media. So please follow us. And so we have a lot of support. Uh, we would not be able to do this much work <laughs> without so many wonderful donors and supporters. So I really appreciate all of the great support we have for our work. And also, um, the in-kind support has been incredible from all around the Adirondack Park and, and New York and um, even other states as well. So um, we are very thankful to our grantors, donors, and supporters. So if you find yourself in the Adirondacks visiting Saranac Lake, please stop in. We have a headquarters where you can learn more about our conservation and research projects and stop in and check out um, a really crazy loon themed gift store. We have everything you can imagine with loons. So um, please stop in. Fantastic. Jennifer, what a fun program that was. And again, I, I'm struck, we've been doing a bunch of bird programs throughout the last couple of days. And quite often it's the simplest little solution. They're not high tech, they're easy. The, the tackle buyback program is such a neat thing. I, I don't know which individual donor was behind that, but what a special program for uh, educating the public while also having a direct impact on conservation all in one fell swoop. It's such a, what a, a neat thing you've got going on. Um, you talked earlier in your program about these hundred lakes and this remote region, all things considered. And I think a lot of us instinctually, you think about Brazil and going into the Amazon, some of these programs we've had in the last few hours, and oh, okay, that's deep in the bush, that's difficult to get to. But a hundred lakes in a remote region of a state is also sounds quite challenging. How do you actually get to all these field sites or are they accessible by road? Do you need to portage with canoes? Like, how are you getting there? Yeah, some of them are very remote. We also have a really good mix though. So. Uh, we have a number of field staff, it's about a dozen people, and they each take you know, five or so lakes per day, or not per day, per week, I should say, <laughs> and go out and try to check on those loons uh, once per week. So they're not out there every single day. Um, but some of them are front country, very easy to access. Other ones are very, very remote. <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, you had this beautiful picture with all the people surrounding the loon trying to nest. And ecotourism is something that we've continually come upon in a lot of the programs of the Global BioFest. So I guess, how do you draw the line? Where is the line? How do you educate people to make sure that they want to come to see the loons and support that region and make sure that there's conservation, I, I guess, for that species and for that area without making it where they're negatively impacting their willingness to nest there or stay there, what have you? Yeah, thank you for asking, because we are we, we want to reach as many people as we can with our conservation and education programs, because a lot of people simply don't realize that a loon is different from a duck. Yep. So, yes, you might get that close to a duck and the duck doesn't care. But loons are something special and unique. So for us, we're trying to inspire people and interest them in our work enough where then they'll want to protect them. Yep. So that's that's always the goal. That's the trick. Yeah, <laughs> no, no one wants. I, I, I don't know if there are any duck programs showing the rest of the BioFest, but no, they're not as exciting as loons. Anyone who's had a chance to see a loon, they're a very, very special bird. And the penguin display—I've never seen anything like that. What a wild! Have you like you have the footage of it? Have you seen this in person regularly, or it's only when they're really upset? Yeah, it doesn't happen very often. So I've only seen it myself once, and they will do it when they're very upset. So this is a loon that, like I mentioned, they're territorial. They may have an intruding loon. So um, say that another male comes into their territory or another female, even the females will do this display. Um, and they're just trying to get that 
individual to leave their territory because on certain occasions, uh, adults will kill the offspring of other loons. So they don't want to give them the opportunity to do that. So everything chills out though a lot around August when they're done raising their chicks, then they're supposed to leave. I chill out more in August as well. It's a pretty yeah. nice thing here. So you highlighted the way that you go about catching loons, which uh, someone on YouTube ungenerously noted is not that it doesn't paint the loons intelligence in the brightest light. The fact that you're shining a big light in their eyes and they're just playing calls and you can sneak up. Does this work on the same loon many times in a row? Like once you've done it with one and you've done this like flashlight big salmon net or are they wary from now on or can you just keep doing that forever? So I made it sound easy, but it is not easy. Okay. Loons are very, very swift. They're very smart. In fact, if we don't have chicks with a, an adult, it's very, very hard to catch the adult because they are so good at dodging that net. So uh, we kind of are reliant during our banding sessions on targeting lakes that have an adults or adults and chicks at them. Uh, there's sometimes when people will send us messages about a loon that's in distress. And if there isn't something really wrong with that loon, we have to wait for it to get into a more serious condition before we can interfere because they're so swift. So there's our, our generous uh, addendum to the earlier part of the program. Loons, very smart. In fact, might be the smartest bird. I think we'll, we'll stick with for the course of this presentation. They are fairly smart. <laughs> yeah, thank you so, so much. And again, you guys are doing such great work. I have checked out your site as you were talking and going through it. That I encourage all our audience, go to adcloon.org. Uh, just some amazing stuff there. Learn about their education and conservation work. And uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for being part of our Global BioFest today. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Good luck.